So we're actually waiting for one more person for quorum, so that's a good thing. We're starting off the new year, hopefully in the right direction. Um, and I want to just thank everyone for coming here and for being on time. I want to welcome all of our guests and our presenters. So um, while we're waiting for quorum, we can start, right? I hope everybody had a great new year. So we'll, do a, we'll have a presentation by Measure of America on a portrait of New York City and data sharing. So is, oh, that's, that would be you and your name is? So come on down, I'm Ingrid, welcome. Uh -huh. You can use the mic, the mic. Oh. You need a clicker? Uh -huh. Joe can help you. So once we get quorum, we'll do the official part of the meeting. In the meantime, we can do the presentation, okay? Okay, great. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk today. Um, my name is Rebecca Gluskin. I'm from a nonprofit in Brooklyn called Measure of America. We're a project of the Social Science Research Council. And um, this past year, we came out with a big report on New York City called A Portrait of New York City. And I wanted to present it to you and talk a little bit about the work we do um, comparing New York City neighborhoods and also providing all the data um, in an easy, accessible format for you and your constituents to use. So just a little bit about Measure America. Um, we're a Brooklyn-based, nonpartisan project. Um, we provide easy-to-use yet methodologically sound tools um, for understanding well-being and opportunity. Um, and through our reports, online tools, evidence-based research, we work with our partners to breathe life into numbers. Um, so all of our projects have a board of advisors that have stakeholders in the community. Um, we partner with academics, um, nonprofits, community-based organizations, local New York City departments and agencies to make sure that we bring together the entire community to advise on these projects. So this was the Portrait of New York City advisory panel. Um, and it was sponsored by the Helmsley Charitable Trust. Um, so all of our work in New York City is, is sponsored by the Helmsley Charitable Trust. Um, we provide, we have these five great projects um, available. So um, starting in 2015, we started data to gonyc Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay, great. <laughs> so um, this was a project based on tons of feedback from New York City agencies, nonprofits, um, community workers who said that they really wanted a place where they could find New York City data in one place at the same geographic level so that they could compare things like health, education, income, all at the same unit so that, you know, instead of going to opendata.nyc and trying to pull things together on their own, you don't need a data science degree to figure out what's going on. So that was data to go. Um, and then from that we wrote the New York City, Portrait of New York City report, which everyone here has a copy. Um, and it provides uh, sound evidence about all the disparities in New York City um, and talks about pinpoints for change. And um, there's tons in there. So I'm just gonna highlight five key aspects from the report. And I wanted to say that we are available for consultation and if you want more copies of the book, we have tons of them and wanna just make sure that the community gets, that we get the word out. Um, we also had a community portraits project where we work with nonprofits to use this data to fuel change in their own organizations. Um, and then most recently in November, we came out with Data to Go Health, and that is a deep dive into health disparities in New York City. Um, so just one quick overview. Um, Measure America works on the, the UN's, develop, um, UN's Human Development Index, and that is something that tries to measure human progress. So instead of looking at things like um, economics, like GDP, we try to create an index that measures human well-being. Um, and that takes into consideration health, um, economics, and education. And it puts people at the center of analysis. So um, we use this framework to measure um, human development, and it's a zero to, one, zero to 10 scale so that we can sort of provide a base level to look at different communities um, on the same scale. So we, take, we calculate the life expectancy, access to knowledge, which is education and, social, and school enrollment, and then also median earnings. And bring them together into one index so that you can kind of get an idea of how people are doing in your community. So in a portrait of New York City, 
we looked at 188 neighborhood tabulation areas um, over all 59 community districts, 170 PUMAs, these are smaller units, which are public use microdata areas, that's what a PUMA stands for, so it's like an aggregation of, of census tracts. Um, and we looked at these in the whole New York area. So we actually looked at New Jer parts of New Jersey, Connecticut, Long Island, and the upper Hudson Valley area to show that our community is also made up of people in the metro area as well. We then broke it down by population group, race, ethnic ethnicity, and Asian and Latino subgroups. We looked at gender, and we also looked at US and foreign born. And then from that, we also broke up the city into five different echelons to show um, that there are actually five New Yorks in New York City, and they're not just boroughs. So um, just to give a brief overview, a resident in the Upper up East Side can expect to live 14 years longer, six, time, six times as likely to have a bachelor's degree, and earns 50K more than someone in Southwest New York. Um, and we, we use this comparator to look at different subway stops and to show how people um, on the five line just you know, five subway stops away can uh, have such disparate um, opportunities and well-being scores. And there's a poster in the book if you're, of this if you want it. Um, so just five quick facts from the report. Um, there's hundreds in there, but I don't want to take up too much of your time. <laughs> um, so as I said, we broke up New York into five different groups. Um, and the way this goes is that uh, Gilded New York is sort of the, quote, 1%, but it's actually more like percent it's the highest one where people are earning the most have the greatest education degrees and then also are living the longest um, and then brought this down scores to Main Street Main Street New York is where the majority of New Yorkers are living there's 10 million people living in that group um, and then to precarious New York where um, where New Yorkers are struggling the most and what that means is is there's sort of a sliding scale across all New York and it in it spans different geographies. So someone in, in Newark may have more in common with someone in Brownsville than someone in Brownsville may have with someone in uh, even Brooklyn Heights. So we're trying to look at geography and commonalities and economic situations and just to show that um, the different disparities in New York. Um, so point number two is that uh, residential segregation uh, really impacts the community as well. And this is a map showing um, for every dot it's 500 people in that population of that race or ethnicity. Um, just to show you sort of a, a, a grand sweeping overview of how segregated New York is. Um, and an and analysis not of our own, it shows that New York has some of the greatest segregation of, of all the metro areas in the country. Um, it's number two on black segregation, number three on Latina segregation, and number three um, on Asian segregation in the country. Um, and that a lot of our population has been changing. Um, so since 2000, there's some pretty, been some pretty sweeping changes in New York City's um, communities. So for example, um, in Bayside and Little Neck, the Asian population in 2007 grew, in 2000 grew from 27% to 2016 to 43%. Um, the Latino population in the Bronx has grown from 27% to, to 41%. Um, in, in Brooklyn, the, the black population in Crown Heights and Prospect Heights has actually shrunk from 78% in 2000 to 57. Um, and the white population in central Brooklyn and Harlem, so here we have in Bedford Syverson, went from 1% to 18% in 2016. There's, so there's been some really dramatic changes in the New York area, and we talk a little bit more about that in one of our chapters. Um, Four, there's a 17-year uh, life expectancy gap in the metro area. Um, so someone in Westchester County, their average person is living to 90 years old, whereas someone in southwest Newark is only living to 73 years old. Um, and then finally, there's huge gender and earnings gaps. Um, this happens for a lot of reasons, things like uh, women taking uh, working different jobs, shouldering disproportionately the care of their family members, um, taking a penalty for motherhood, uh, harmed by inflexible and sexist work cultures, and wage discrimination. And we look at it in different, different racial and ethnic groups as well. Um, but just to say that what we do with this report is we try to use the data to set goals for New York City. 
Um, so one of the goals and the policies that we outline in the book are to lift up the precarious and struggling New Yorkers um, from a score by one, one point. So increasing life expectancy by one year, uh, educational enrollment by 6%, and median earnings by 4,000. And we outline the, the ways, the policies in New York City that we, that our advisory board and our members kind of think that would raise that, that point by. Um, and then just to talk a, one minute about Data to Go and Data to Go Health. So this is an online resource that you can play with data till your heart's content. And it is all by community district, so you can compare your community district to others on things such as uh, work, housing conditions, um, 311 complaints, a ton of things that you can find um, at the federal, state, and local level, but not all in one place. So this is a place where you can look at data in a really simple format, export it for power presentation, PowerPoint presentations, things that really can help you drive change. And we have been doing this since 2015 and plan to do it uh, at least five more years in the future. So it's here to stay. Um, and we update it on an annual basis. So just an example, this is voter turnout in 2016. Brooklyn had one of the highest voter turnouts in uh, Brooklyn Heights and Fort Greene. And then also one of the lowest turnouts in um, Bath Beach. So just to show the huge differences within the borough. And this tool is easy to use, it's free. Uh, it brings together all the data, it's presented by community district, and it will be here to stay. We're not taking it down anytime soon. Um, so yeah, those are the three tools that Measure of America provides, um, and we feel that data really helps drive forward change, and so we hope that this data will both let you know a little bit more about your district, but then also help you set goals. And we're here if you guys need any research or help with your community district. Um, and yeah, I'm here for any questions too. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Do we have any questions for Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Please state your name and your question and your board. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my name is Richard Flatall. I chair Community Board 3, which is Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, I heard a report in the last week, I think, talking about the um, population changes in New York. I think New York as a state actually lost population, which means that we're probably gonna lose one or two congressional seats. And uh, you know, I think the city has probably gained quite a bit of population. Um, but have you looked at, I know you looked at the five boroughs and the surrounding areas. Um, do you have any ideas about um, why the state would have lost population? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know why that the state as a whole, I mean, the you know, upper, upper cities in New York are, are struggling. Um, so that the, the economies in, in Buffalo and Syracuse and, and those cities are definitely uh, hurting, for sure. But um, I think this is to say that the 2020 census is really important. Um, and I don't know if you guys are talking about that in your districts yet, but getting people to fill out those surveys really matters um, for congressional districts, for counting um, and making sure your population is counted. So um, I don't know what the, re you know, I don't know the exact reason, but I just know that the census is really important for counting every single voter. And, um, and I know there's a lot of fear in communities about the potential census and, and all the implications around it. Um, but I, I think this is just a stress to say that, I, but if we lose voters that way by people just not filling it out, um, I think that would be a huge loss to our city. So um, yeah, it doesn't answer your question, but raises another, <laughs> another one. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, Rebecca, thank you very much. Okay. Excellent presentation. Thank the you. book sounds as if it's a great read, so thank you. I encourage um, the boards to please invite Rebecca to come and do a presentation for your full board, you know, and so she can give our books. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll move forward with the business at hand. First, I would like to have the minutes of the November 7th Borough Board meeting adopted. May I have someone please make the motion and a second? Oh, sorry, Karen's reminding me, roll call. Roll call. You're falling short, Teresa. You usually keep me on point. You're slipping, Teresa. You're slipping. You slip, Teresa. Okay, so let's do roll call. Karen, please. 
Community Board 1. Community Board 2. Robert Paris representing Lily Singletary. Community Board 3. Here. Community Board 4. Community Board 5. Community Board 6. Community Board 7. Community Board 8. Here. Community Board 9. Community Board 10. Community Board 11. Community Board 12. Community Board 13. Here. Community Board 15. Here. Community Board 15. Here. Community Board 16. Community Board 17. Here. Community Board 18. Councilmember Barron? Here. Councilmember Cornegie? Present. Councilmember Cumbo? Here. Councilmember Deutsch? Present. Councilmember Espinal? Councilmember Matthew Eugene? Councilmember Brannon? Here. Councilmember Yeager? Councilmember Lander? Here. Councilmember Levin? Here. Councilmember Mizell? Councilmember Amphrey Sample? Present. Councilmember Menchaca? Councilmember Reynoso? Councilmember Traeger? Here. Councilmember Williams? Here. Somebody just walked in. <laughs> Who is it? Who is it? Councilmember Community Board 7? Okay, thank you. I want to thank all of you who are here present, and especially those of you who came on time. It's important that we actually come to the meeting and we come on time so that we can start and finish expeditiously. So again, thank you. So now, may I have someone make a motion to adopt the meetings from November 7th, and then someone second. Please say your name in the mic. In the mic. <laughs> Yes. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 50, motion to approve the November Borough Board Minutes. May I have a second? Second, Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. Thank you. All of those in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Anyone against? Any abstentions? Okay, good. Motion carries. May I have a motion to adopt the minutes from the December 5th, 2018 Borough Board meeting? Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, motion to adopt the December Borough Board Minutes. December 5th, 2018. Do I have anyone second that motion, please? Kim Robinson. Kim Robinson, Councilmember Samuel's office. You second the motion? Second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Any abstention? Okay, so the motion carries. I thank you. So tonight we have... <clears throat> a vote on the resolution for the Take the Wedge Pledge to shape better waterfronts by the Waterfront Alliance. I believe that they were here at the last borough board meeting, which I missed. So they made a presentation at that time. So now we're here for the vote on it. I would like to welcome Ms. Sarah Daughtry and Mr. Simar. Samir. Samir, what's your last name? Dalal. Dalal? Okay, because your name isn't here. So, but I remembered it from meeting you. So come on forward if you want to say a few words before we do the vote. Please come up. Yes, please. You can, the mic is portable, you can take it out. Mm -hmm. So they'll say a few words. Those of you who were here for the presentation, you may ask some questions so that we can move forward. Thank you and thank you all for having us again and for voting tonight. Um, I'm Sarah Doherty. You probably have heard from me in the past 24 hours um, and over the past couple of months, hopefully. Um, but the resolution we're proposing is for waterfront projects to use our guidelines, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, with the acronym WEDGE, um, for waterfront projects. So WEDGE is similar to the LEED certification, 
for waterfront projects, except it's only for waterfront projects. And the three things that Wedge promotes are more resilient waterfront design, more accessible waterfront design, and more sustainable waterfront design. Um, and at a time when Brooklyn and New York City's waterfronts are changing so rapidly, and as was mentioned in the last presentation, there's a lot of disparities. Wedge is a tool that can help community boards um, better advocate to protect their communities from flood risk and coastal storms, um, and to also allow them to have a stronger voice in the ULERP process. Um, and when waterfront projects come before your board, you can point to Wedge, which is a free set of guidelines um, as a tool to show what good waterfronts look like. So even though not everybody has a district that is on the waterfront, we hope that um, Brooklyn will support this movement that we're trying to create to promote uh, more equitable and resilient waterfronts. And sorry, Samir, I totally overtook it. And this is Samir, who's also helping us, uh, and you may have heard from as well. So thank you all. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are. Thank you. Do we have any questions, um, those of you who are here? Please. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15. Last month, I was quite impressed at your presentation. Community Board 15 is a waterfront community. After Superstorm so Sandy, most of the community was devastated. There are still homes that have not been brought back to their original. So your proposal to bring more resilient construction to our waterfront is extremely important to our community, and we fully endorse it for Southern Brooklyn. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Do we have any more comments or questions? Please. Yeah, hi. Community Board 13, which is part of Brighton Beach, Coney Island, Seagate, and part of Gravesend. Could you please state your name for the oh, record? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank Sam you. Sam Shimon Rinkowski, Community Board 13. All right, so CB13 issued a letter of support for using Wedge as a, as a reference point and standard for the waterfront projects. So Community Board 13 gave letter of support. So we have two waterfront areas in Brooklyn, both support the project. Do we have any other comments? Yes, please state your uh, name and your board. Yes, good evening. Globani Bravo Lopez, uh, Cal Office of Council Member Stephen Levin. Um, so I was actually not here for the last presentation, and of course, uh, the 33rd actually includes uh, CB1 and CB2, but my question was really to what extent this is actually a community-driven process, um, uh, given various developments. Obviously, there are a myriad of development, uh, developments and waterfront development in particular, spanning uh, both, both one and two, uh, you know, going up to northern Brooklyn and as far up as, far up as uh, Greenpoint Landing, so I just wanted to see to what extent the local community gets to weigh in on this. Obviously, you know, sustainability uh, and resilience, considering future f impacts of uh, climate change um, and impact of future weather events, you know, is, is pertinent and important, to say the least. Um, but just and I wanted to get a sense of that, what, where the local community gets to weigh in. Um, yes, so if I'm understanding correctly, you are making sure that this is a tool that can make the community have a stronger voice in what they want on the waterfront. Is that right? That's right. OK. Um, yes, very strongly yes. Um, that is a huge concern that the Waterfront Alliance has, um, which is that with all of the rapid waterfront development that's happening, um, communities are a part, and not just the usual small groups of, of people, but a wide range of stakeholders is involved in saying what they want to be built on the waterfront from saying that they want affordable housing to saying that they want public space that's not just sterile, boring, you know, esplanade, but has things like kayak launches or wetlands, restored wetlands, um, to, you know, having building height that incorporates additional height for um, mid to high range sea level rise predictions through the 2100. So, the city doesn't actually require that buildings are um, elevated to include future sea level rise. Um, and that's something that we advocate and give guidance for in our guidelines. So um, yes, we, it's a community tool. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add to what Sarah was sharing is that there, there are three main focuses in the, the wedge guidelines uh, as a communications tool between developers and the community. Um, and the three are, as she mentioned, she highlighted earlier, are uh, resiliency, which we are all talking about and we're all very, very aware of. Um, the second is uh, ecology and environmental health. And the third is, is access to the community. Now, access to the community is, is as Sarah highlighted, is, is accessibility to, for recreational purposes and economic purposes. But it, it is also um, about how well developers, as well as projects that, that are developing along the waterfront, how well they engage with the community to ensure that the, the waterfront development really is what the community wants it to be used as. Um, and so it, it is, as Sarah mentioned, the lead, it's similar to how LEED uh, works in certifying projects. So, so they can be scored based on how well they do in each of these categories. And so it really does promote uh, encouragement um, and encourages uh, engagement with the community so that it really represents that community's voice that they can use and, and work and act on the waterfront. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wait, you have another question. Please speak into the mic and state your name. Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. Um, I understand that right now the certification is free, correct? How long do you anticipate that it will be free and then when there is a charge, do you know what the charge will be for the certification? So thank you for bringing that up again. Um, right now the guidelines and certification process is free. The guidelines will always be free. They're available on our website right now. Um, in mid-2019, early 2020, we expect to start charging fee-for-service for the certification. And that would be, we're looking at other certifications like LEED, Envision, Sites, there's a million certifications out there. Um, but we aim to be more affordable than that. So I think the LEED certification starts at something like 7,000 and then there's, they have a whole pricing scheme based on the size and um, some additional review, like you can pay to get your review expedited. Um, and so we're, we're modeling off of that, but uh, we haven't yet determined exactly what that will be. But to clarify, for the purpose of this resolution, it's not to require waterfront projects to get certified. We really just want community boards and developers to use our guidelines as a reference, as an ed educational tool, and as a standard. So even if your community board never certifies a project, um, which by the way, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Greenpoint Landing, um, and Sunset Park Material Recovery Facility um, are the three certified projects we have. But even if nobody certifies projects, we still want Wedge to be used as a resource. Do we have any other questions? Yes, please state your name for the record and your board. Mary Spitzer, Community Board 12. Mm -hmm. um, Teresa is for the project, so uh, I'm, I'm for it. Thank you. For, <laughs> uh, we're not a waterfront uh, district. But I have a quick question. Um, the, the requirements that all water, waterfront projects in the borough should be referred to which, so this would be a requirement for a project to become certified? Um, we would like for all waterfront projects that come before the community board um, to use wedge as a reference. So when you learn about it, say here's the wedge guy, or they should use wedge as a reference early on in the process. So my, my question is if there will be a requirement and how that's, that's how the word that is in the, in the resolution. I was just wondering. Oh, no, we, I think, I believe the language says we encourage um, waterfront projects to consider wedge certification where feasible. So encourage um, versus require. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading from the resolution. And it okay. says that the Brooklyn Borough Board supports the requirement that all waterfront projects in the borough should refer to wedge standards. Yes. Refer to, to wedge standards, not, it is not required that all waterfront projects become okay. wedge certified. Thank you. Yep. Do we have any other questions? 
No other questions? I have a motion to approve the resolution for the waterfront edge design guidelines known as WEDGE. No, which, what are you looking at? I'm looking at. Okay. Therefore, it should be resolved that the Brooklyn Borough Board. Wait, wait, wait. Supports the requirement. The re it should read the proposal. I didn't see it. That no, all the waterfront the projects, the not the requirement. To Top of page two. Yeah, well, it's just saying that it refers to it. It doesn't say that you have to adapt it. It's just saying that they should refer to it, meaning that they should look at it, give it consideration, that it should be something that is thought of no. before they move. Yeah, that's what it means to no. refer. The Brooklyn Borough Board supports the requirement that all waterfront projects in the borough should refer to wedge standards. It's not a requirement. We're not no, but it says got to. no. They're saying that they want people to refer to it, to look at it. They're not saying you have to adopt it. I don't want to argue with you about semantics. No. So if you want to change the word, but what it means is that they want every project that's coming into Brooklyn to look at it as a frame of reference, but they don't have to adopt it. That's but they, oh, sorry, sorry. That's, that's exactly right. They want you to use it as a frame of reference, to use it to consider it as a standard. But you don't have to do it, but they want you to have to at least look at it. Okay. That's, what this, that's what this is saying, that we want it to be required that you at least look at it and give it consideration. That's what they're asking you to do. I they're not saying that you have to accept it. I still think the word requirement needs to be changed. To what? To what? Encourage. Encourage. <laughs> This is about semantics, I said. Would, would it be, I have a question about implementation, because I think as it stands, to us it seems, you know, if we say required, we would have to rely on all of you to use Wedge as an informational, educational tool with developers, but I think that this language is relatively soft, um, and we really are relying on you all, when you need it, to, it's not, it's not intended to be a burden or something that is mandated for everything. It's to empower you all when there's a project that you're concerned about or you want a stronger say in to say, use Wedge. They want to make sure that the developers are using a good standard or a good matrix when they're developing something new in a waterfront area. They want the developers to look at Wedge as the standard bearing. They don't have to do it, but they want them to at least look at it and give it serious, serious thought. I can't. So, um, if I may ask, this also this is comp also for like one family houses or anything going through variance. You want every single home so in the waterfront to go through this? Wedge, the certification and the guidance is applicable to a very wa wide range, parks, industrial projects, multifamily, residential, commercial, it is not applicable to single family homes. Um, so if that answers your question. Um, but again, it would be a reference for developers to use, not a requirement that all of these projects would need to be wedge certified. I think just to, just to give another example as to why it was phrased that Wait. way. Oh, yes, Simon, okay, go ahead. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Okay. I didn't know where it was coming from. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't recognize my voice already? <laughs> Pardon me, I'm sorry. Um, so just to give an example, so like let's say if Sarah purchases a, a plot of land along the waterfront and wants to develop some, something, some project, whether it be a park or um, you know, let's say she's either state government and wants to develop a park, or, or she's a developer and wants to develop some, some big high-rise housing. Um, so th the reason why it's saying they're required to refer to it is say, let's say I, as the community, say, 
goes to Sarah and says, Sarah, we would like you to, to look at these guidelines because this is the standard that we, we feel is important for waterfront um, developments and projects. So please look at, these, as, at this. And Sarah then has the free choice after looking at it to see if she wants to uh, go for it to get to be wedge certified. So that's why it says require that, it, that we refer them to the certification. And to implement to the best of their ability. So they don't have to, but it's really to safeguard the new development because we saw what happened with Hurricane Sandy. So that's what it's to do. It's really to safeguard the new development. Um, a question, please take the mic and state your name and, and your council member you're representing. Um, Joy Simmons from council member Inez Barron's office. Um, just a question with regard to the requirement. Um, that is on the onus of who exactly in terms of who is required. Is it required of the community board or the offices to say to them, look at this, or who, who's supposed to enforce the requirement? Because there is a requirement. The requirement is to at least look at it. So who is the person, the entity, that's, the, that's going to be saying, look, you are required to do this? Well, when new developments come to the office of the borough president, we would definitely tell them we want you to look at the wedge or if, if we wanted it to be LEED certified. So we would want the community board to also say to the developer, we want you to look at this. We, just like we would want the council member to say, we want you to look at this. But is it I required for us to say that? That's what I'm just, I um, just want to get clear. Is it required for the city council office to say to the developer, look at this? Or is it just required, like who's doing the action? As I just said to you, if a developer comes before the borough president's office, mm -hmm. we would tell them about the wedge project. Just like we would encourage the community board members to tell them about the wedge project, just as we would encourage the council member to do the same thing. We can't make the council member, but we no, would no, encourage it. I understand it. that, yeah. but I'm just so trying to get to it's what the, it's saying. Is it, is it's it the saying that the city council office is required to tell the developer to look at this? To it look says at that the Brooklyn Borough Board supports the requirement, that we are in agreement that this should be a requirement, that whoever the developer, it, ver, ver, whoever the developer is mm -hmm. looks at this standard. And we're asking the elected officials, the community board, as well as the office of the borough president to do their best to have that standard implemented. I'm okay. clear, and but I think it's a great cannot, thing, but I'm just not, con it's just a little confusing to me. I don't know, maybe it's just me in terms of who's it, the It shouldn't be confusing, because we can't require the council to do anything, okay? We ask the council to work in partnership, mm -hmm. just like we ask the community board to work in partnership and the office of the borough president. We, as a borough board, are saying that this is the standard that we would like to set for our borough, so that if something like a Hurricane Candy, can't, Hurricane Sandy were to again occur, be protected to some degree so we have to work in partnership so that's why we're making it a resolution so it's our thought that as a team we would all be on page so if a developer comes to council member Barron's office she would say you know a great project near waterfront area although you don't have waterfront we're using it no, hypothetically okay I didn't realize that's this, how so. we have a lot of water okay yeah. good thanks for sharing that with me so we have a waterfront area, and we think that this is a good way for you to go. When the developer comes to the office of the borough president, we would say the same thing, and so would the community board. And if the developer really wants to work in partnership with the community, he would look at it and take it into consideration and try his or her best to implement the standards that are wedge certified. So that's what we're saying. It has to be a partnership. But we can't mandate because you work for an elected official, just as I work for an elected official, and we have the privilege of appointing board members, but they're independent entities. That's why we're doing a resolution as a team. Did I answer that correctly? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Question, yes. Yeah. Um, you have to state say, your name. Yep. All right. Cesar Zuniga, Chair of Community Board 7. Uh, so I have just two comments. The first one, um, this, is, um, this is a good thing. And 
it, it, it is actually like a, a very soft um, ask of any developer to just look at something for the protection of our waterfront. So I think I, think I absolutely agree with, with Sarah, the threshold is really low. This is the least we can do, right? We should, I don't think we would be going far enough to say we require these things of developers, right? But that's a whole other conversation with elected officials and, and a whole bunch of other stakeholders. So I think from, this, from that perspective, this is not such a heavy lift. That's one. Two, um, I think the, where we should be drilling down a little bit more is, is really that whole clause around community engagement, community access, right? And we don't have to do that tonight, but I think that's more worthy of, of figuring out ways of how to really truly get people more engaged, right? Because as Community Board 7 can attest to, we're, go we're undergoing one of the most rapid redevelopments in the whole city through Industry City and some of the other stuff that's happening in our, on our waterfront. Um, what we need is to really have, this be, have these processes be community-led as much as possible. So I, I would just say let's, let's support this and then let's get on to other conversations that relate to engagement and access for real, like in a real way. Thank you. Do we have any other questions or comments, concerns? So we're going to ask for a motion and then a second and then we're going to do a roll call vote. We're gonna call each one of you individually who's representing the community board, okay? So may I have a motion to Approve the resolution for the waterfront edge design guidelines, known as WEDGE. Cesar Zuniga makes a motion to move the question. Thank you. Second, please. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, seconds the motion. Thank you. Karen, would you call each individual member? Thank you. Um, community Board 1. Yeah, yeah. only no. the ones who are here. Oh. Okay, Community Board 2. Lenny Singletary, yes. Community Board 3? Community Board 3? Yes. Sorry. Community Board 7? Yes. Community Board 8? Yes. Community Board 9? I mean 10? Yes. Community Board 12? Yes. Community Board 15? Yes. Community Board 16? Yes. Community Skip Board 13. 17? We can go. We can go back and Community do it. Board thirteen. My yes. Councilmember Barron. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> Councilmember Barron. Yes. Councilmember Cornegie? Yes. Councilmember Combo? Yes. Councilmember Eugene? Yes. Councilmember Brannon? Yes. Councilmember Lander? Yes. Councilmember Levin? Abstain. Councilmember Amprey Samuel? Yes. Councilmember Traeger? Yes. And Councilmember Williams? And officer of the Bible president, wait, did you leave someone out? Yes. And the officer of the Bible president, Brooklyn Bible president, Eric L. Adams, yes. Um, one more, council member yeah. Deutsch. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you. So motion carries. Um, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, we had another vote this evening, but we don't have a representative here from the Prosper Park Alliance. Did they show up? Oh, you're here. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that you were here. I asked Karen, and they told me she told me no, you weren't here. Okay, so we have a vote on the proposal for the Long Meadow Ball Fields. Um, you want to come forward? They did a presentation also, right? Um, so, good evening, everyone. I'm Jabari Taylor. I'm an assistant landscape architect at the Prospect Park Alliance. Um, and uh, this uh, was presented last month at, at the December meeting. Um, and I have the presentation if uh, you all like me to do it again. Would that be necessary? I don't know. No. Oh, OK. So are there any questions? No questions whatsoever. 
Okay. So I'd like to have a motion to approve the proposal for the design of the long metal ball field. Point of order. Who's voting on this? Is it just the community board for Prospect Park or, or the full borough board? They have me at the, they have it down as the full borough board. It doesn't matter. <laughs> they have it as excuse me. Yeah, they have it as a full borough board. Yes. yes. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, motion to approve the Prospect Park ball fields. Thank Ed you. Powell, uh, Board 14, uh, second. Thank you. So let's do the same kind of vote. Community Board 2? Yes. Community Board 3? Yes. Community Board 7? Yes. Community Board 8? Yes. Community Board 10? Yes. Community Board 12? Yes. Community Board 13? Yes. Community Board 14? Yes. Community Board 15? Yes. Community Board 16? Yes. Community Board 17? They must have stepped away. Oh, Community Board 17? Yes. Council Member Barron? Yes. Council Member Cornegie? Yes. Council Member Cumbo? Yes. Council Member Deutsch? Yes. Council Member Eugene? Yes. Council Member Brannon? Yes. Council Member Lander? Council Member Levin? Yes. Council Member Mizell? Yes. Council Member MP Samuel? Yes. Council Member Traeger? Yes. Council Member Williams? Yes. And Vice President? Yes. Officer of the Vice President, yes. So motion carries. Um, that concludes our business related to the Prospect Park Alliance. We thank you very much for your presentation. Short but sweet. Um, at this time, do any members of the borough board have any unfinished business that they'd like to discuss? Any new business? Um, well, I would like to take the liberty to ask um, people who are here for the first time, if you would be kind enough to stand up, say your name, who you're representing, and we want to welcome you. Your first time, right? Pleasure to meet you all. Uh, have a good night. My name is Vladimir Edward from Council Member Matthew Jean's office, and uh, this is my second time being here. Pleasure seeing you all here. Hi, good evening. My name is Sydney Penn. I'm here representing Council Member Carnegie. It's my first meeting, um, so thank you. Happy New Year to all of you. Happy New Year to you. Do we have anyone else? Okay, so thank all of you very much. Um, may I please have a motion? to adjourn the meeting. <laughs> you do it. You do it. We're going to be here all night. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, motion to adjourn. May I have a second? Second. Well, who's, wait, wait, wait. We have to do it in order. I need a name, board. Who's second in the motion? Barry Spitzer, Community Board 12, a second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Any abstentions? Any oppositions? Okay. Thank you all very much. Have a good evening.